All the time? Exactly. It's good to be here together. And um, uh, we're going to end this series today for eternal salvation. And just to remind you, next week we will be beginning with a series on Jonah. I want to invite you, most probably the most preached portion of Scripture in the Bible, Jonah. Um, and uh, I believe God is also something for us in, um, in that book to, to hear and to learn as His children. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to it, uh, Romans chapter 5. We're going to end with verse 9 to verse 11. I'll put it up there for you. But I don't want you to be lazy and not bring your Bibles anymore because the um, Scripture is on there. So maybe just bring a different translation, different version, so that you can see what um, the difference is. I'm reading from the ESV translation. Everything all working well. Let's read together from verse 9. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the words of life, the words of truth that bring salvation and brings liberty to those who come to you in faith this morning and trust in you. And I pray that your words... Will be, will, will be powerful this morning so that we can hear what you want to say. May we open our hearts, may we uh, open our eyes, Lord, so that we can, can see your truth and hear your word in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Good. We have spent some time in um, Romans and... Um, uh, I will, after this service, see if I can put up all the videos on there. I, this last two weeks were hectic. So um, then we'll see if we can put it up there. And for those who missed some of the sermons. So if you missed some of the sermons, if you... Um, I remember when I was in Ruston with the pastor, they always said, let one slip one. For those who know the pray, you let one slip one. Uh, Sunday, so... <laughs> you can go in there and, and watch uh, the other sermons. And um, especially chapter 5. And the main theme of this chapter is the guarantees of our eternal salvation. And he tells us about God's promises to us as His, as his children. Um, he justifies us on the basis of Christ, um, on the basis of our faith in Christ. And we have already seen that salvation, eternal life, is a gift from God. Uh, it's, an, a, it's, it's a gift that we cannot earn, that we cannot um, uh, merit by our good works. We can do nothing to get that. A gift is a gift. If I give you a gift on your birthday, you're not going to pay me for it. Otherwise, you just slap in my face. Um, but it's not, a, it's, it's not something you earn. And I want to say this morning... That when God gives us a gift, He never takes it back. No, one, no amen. amen. If God gives us a gift, He never takes it back. Now, just to take you, um, remind you, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, this is a gift of God. Salvation, according to the scripture, salvation is the gift. Salvation is the gift of God, and it is guaranteed. And yes, people make promises, but people break promises. Okay? Um, people cannot be trusted. Even ourselves, who are saved and call ourselves children of God, we disappoint others. We disappoint so many times other people. We, so many times we disappoint God. It is in our sin nature, 
And as Paul says in Romans 7, he says, those things that I should do, I do not. And those things that I do, should not do, I do. And um, people are unreliable. You are unreliable. People are unfaithful. And un uh, not trustworthy. But I want to tell you something, and, I, and you should never forget this. Never forget this. This can make maybe a kind of a slogan or something. God is faithful always. No, he means to me. God is faithful. Just say to the guy next to you, God is faithful always. Yeah, I'm getting them started. They're still in that. And the first, this is not yes, the gear. So let's go to the second gear. Okay, just to remind you, um, this is a very important scripture. And this is. Jeremiah 17 5 it says thus says the Lord cursed is the man who trusts in man and make flesh his strength whose heart turns away from the Lord he is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come he shall dwell in the po um, parched, 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 that's right? parched. parched he shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land now look at the contrast Verse 7, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its, its leaves remain green and it's not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Can you see the difference between someone who does not trust God but trusts himself and someone that trusts God. That's a huge difference. Remember the guy creeping, crawling on the ice in fear, anxious, because he's not trusting in the ice. He's trusting in his own ability to get across. But the one who's riding on the horse, smiling, singing joyfully, he trusts the ice because he knows it's solid and strong enough. It's the same with us. And the difference between our trusting in man in trusting in God, it's a huge difference. Man fails, but let me just give you assurance this morning, not because I said so, because God says, God never fails. God is trustworthy. God is faithful always. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says, If we are faithless, He remains faithful. faithful. Because he cannot deny himself. Hebrew 10.23 Let us hold fast. We just sang, uh, sang the song. Um, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So it's not actually us holding on to Christ. We hold fast to the confession. But it is Christ that is faithful that holds us. And keeps us. And he is from, uh, faithful because he promised to give us eternal life. Why should we, should you hold fast the confession of your faith? Because He is faithful. Amen? First yeah. Amen. Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23, another important verse, says, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, who keeps us? The important question. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Who is doing it? God is doing it. He will surely do what? He will keep us, our spirit, our soul, our body, blameless until the coming of Christ. That can only happen by one means. If God saves us continuously. Remember, salvation passed. He saved us from the punishment of sin, but He saves us continuously. That is sanctification. God keeps us blameless until Jesus comes. And um, again, I want to say this. God is faithful always. He cannot deny Himself. Now, Romans 5 mentions six guarantees. We've already spoken about four of them. That forever binds us to God. And the first one, let me just remind you. We have peace with God. 
We are no longer his enemy. We are now called his, just as he called Abram his friend. Um, we, we are called his friends. The second guarantee is we live and stand in grace. We are no longer under the curse of the law, but we are fixed in grace. We are settled in grace. We have obtained access through faith into this grace in which we stand, into which we, we are fixed. The third guarantee is we, receive, we received a living hope. A hope of the glory of God. When God saves you, He already gives. When, he, when you become a child of God, He gives with that salvation gift, He gives you a promise of an in, eternal inheritance. An inheritance that is kept by the, uh, in heaven by the power of God. It cannot, um, it cannot perish. Now the fourth guarantee is the assurance of love. And God's love was poured into our hearts by giving us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was uh, is the, uh, the, the earnest, the guarantee of our salvation. And it's given to every believer. There's no such thing as a spiritless believer. New Testament. Talking about New Testament, not Old Testament. There's no such thing as a, a Christian that does not have the Spirit of God. Romans 8 verse 9, you can go and read, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong to Him. Simple as that. And your our salvation is eternal. Why? Because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, nothing can separate us from His love. Now, the one we're going to look at is deliverance. And this is very important that we also go into detail with this. Now, can you today make the following statement? Can you say, I am free. Who can say that? I am free. Uh, only a few. <laughs> can you declare that God saved my soul? Can you say that this morning? Yes. God delivered me from, uh, from death and punishment of sin. But when we say we are free or we are saved, the question is, I'm saved, I'm delivered from what? Sin and death. Sin and death. Sometimes we, we tell people, I'm free, Christ saved me, I'm free, but they don't understand what you're free from. It's like when you, when, when I was a student, I was driving there, Rupert, there on, uh, at Westgate, and through the tunnel, Someone wrote on the wall, Jesus is the answer. And then someone else asked, what is the question? <laughs> and it's true, because we say we are free, but the question is from what? From what are we free? From what are we delivered? From what are we saved? And the answer is simply, we are saved from the wrath of God. According to this scripture. We are saved from the wrath of God. We are saved... From the punishment of sin. Let me read our scripture this morning again. It says verse 9. Since we have now been justified by His blood. Remember verse 1. Since we have been justified by faith. Okay. And then he goes on. But now verse 9 starts with the same um, kind of language. He says since we have been justified by His blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Through Him. Saved from His wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? And I don't want you to miss this this morning. It's so important. These verses, um, they are an incredible promise to all the believers. You'll remember we looked last week at, um, I touched on, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, don't, I don't have it on here, that says He delivers us from the wrath to come. Do you remember that? He delivers us from the wrath to come. And Romans 5 verse 9 says, says the same thing. It says that we shall be saved from God's wrath through Him. In other words, we are saved by God, from God, to God. This is a yeah. very important statement I'm going to make. We are saved by God 
We are saved from God and we are saved for God. God delivers us from Himself. Let that sink in. God delivers us from Himself for Himself. <coughs> now if we go back to Egypt, when the Israelites were in Egypt, God sent ten plagues to Egypt. And the tenth plague, if, if you can remember, was when God sent the death angel to put the firstborn sons of Egypt to death. And yes, God did, did this to deliver Israel from slavery. But however, it didn't stop there. The Israelites had to put on the Passover's lamb's blood on the doorposts of their houses. These papers get confused. I'm confused. <laughs> Is that print? <laughs> Prints not the right way. If, if my sermon doesn't make sense today, it's not my fault. Poor workman always blames his children. I want to get a cable to my tab so I can use my tab again because... This thing is confusing now. Yeah, let's hope it's in the right order. Okay, when God <coughs> delivered Israel, the Israelites from, from Egypt, they had to take a, a perfect lamb and slaughter it and take the blood and put it on the doorposts of their houses. So when God, that night, when God killed the, young, the firstborn of Egypt, that was a sign to the people that they were saved from God Himself. Okay? The Lamb's blood symbolically shielded the children of the Israelites from God's wrath because the Lamb was slain in their place. Foreshadowing, obviously, the eternal salvation that comes to those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Do you follow me? Now, it is true that we are saved from the guilt of sin. It is true that we are saved from the punishment of sin. It is true that we are saved from the bondage and enslavement of sin. But more significantly, God saves us from His Himself, from His wrath against sin. But we are not only saved by God and from God, we are also saved for God. Let's read that together in Revelation 5 verse 9. It says, And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open this, its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. Christ ransomed People for God. King James Version says, He redeemed us to God. The American Standard Version says it this way. He says that we are purchased unto God. God saves, He delivers us from Himself to Himself. So let that just sink in a little bit. In, because it's so important that you understand. Yes, we benefit from this deliverance. Yes, we receive the free gift of eternal life. Yes, God saves us, but God Himself is the primary beneficiary of this redemption. God is the primary beneficiary of this redemption. Redemption. Christ purchased sinners for God. God's primary motive for deliverance is not us, but God's glory. We are the recipients and not the primary end of salvation. So we are delivered from God, from His wrath. We are delivered by God and by, by the sacrifice of Christ. And we are delivered for God, for His pleasure, 
for His praise, for His glory. That's why God saved us. There's nothing to boast in it. You cannot say, oh, walking in the streets of the golden streets in heaven one day and say, oh, it's wonderful to walk here. I made it. There's nothing to boast. God saves us for His own glory. Now we know that us being saved from God's wrath through Christ is a present reality. This is important. Although it is still a future event, it is now a present reality. I'm zooming in on verse um, 1. Uh, Romans 5 verse 9. It says, we shall be saved from God's wrath through Him. Shall be saved. Is that salvation, past, present, or future? future. Salvation? Future. future. And this is God's promise to His children. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and hope of salvation. Remember I spoke on that. The hope of salvation, salvation future. For God has not destined us for wrath. I mean, Are you yeah. following me? <coughs> God did not destine His children, those in Christ, He destined to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to say something maybe... Um, some people can disagree with me, but we are not destined for wrath. We are de this is what the Bible calls predestination. And I know it's a, it's a word that many uh, theologians and people shy from. They don't want to talk about this. But this is what the Bible calls predestination. This is not saying that God, God predestined individuals, those you, you, you going to be saved, and those you and you, you going to be lost. This is not what it's saying. It is saying... That those, this portion of scripture is written for believers. He's saying that those who are saved, God predest of God, destined them not for wrath, but for salvation. So God destined those in Christ not to be damned. He destined those to obtain salvation. That is the future final glory. So destination, predestination was also for well, was always salvation future, not salvation past. Okay, for the theologians here, we can debate that. Is the salvation, is this salvation past, present, or future that he's talking about in verse 9? Salvation? Future. Now, this is our future salvation, and God's children are destined for, for salvation, for the final salvation, final glory. This is God's promise to us. And this can only be true if all our sins, all our sins, past, present sins, and future sins, is dealt with. Some people have this idea that God, Christ, when He died on the cross, He only died and paid the penalty for our past sins. That's not true. Christ actually died for all unrighteousness in the universe. He died for all of it. We just receive that benefit of salvation. You see, God's justice is satisfied in Christ's atonement. God is satisfied with Christ's death on the cross. God's judge, judgment upon all our sins, past, present and future, is being dealt with upon the cross... And it is for this reason that we can now say that we are delivered, we are safe from the future wrath. It's for this reason. We are not only delivered from the bondage of sin, but we are delivered from the future wrath. The punishment. Please note these tenses in this verse. Right. This is one of those papers that is confused. Okay, let me go. If, if, if I'm correct, we at 
Romans 8 verse 1. It says, there, there is therefore no, now, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. I want you to listen carefully. God's children never can and never will go to hell. You know, I see you happy about that. Because, why? Because they are saved from hell at the moment they are born again. At the moment God saves you, you are saved from hell. That is a present reality, although it's still a future event. God's children can never be lost. This is what Romans 5 says, that we shall be saved from God's wrath. And this is the guarantee of our eternal salvation. Let me go to verse 9. Verse 9 says, Since, and I've, I've made it yellow, so you'll, you'll see why that it made, made it yellow. And the other one, orange and red. And there's, if you can see that clearly, I don't know if you got good eyes there's through him through his life that is a little bit greenish okay how does he save us how does he save us since we have been justified by his blood okay we are justified and made righteous by the death of his son he paid for our sin. He was punished for our transgression so that we don't have to be punished one day. Do you follow? And if this is true, how can a child of God lose his salvation and then be punished when he or she has been already forgiven? Think about that. If God has forgiven you, all your trespasses and sin, how can He punish you again if you already paid for it? Now the sacrifice of Christ makes us acceptable for God. We have peace with God. We stand in grace. We have the hope of the glory of God. His love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that is given to us. We are delivered from the wrath of God. And this all was made possible by His blood, by His death, by His resurrection. Now, I want to make a comment on this. And this is just maybe a little bit off track. But when the Bible speaks about the blood of Jesus Christ, it is not speaking about a mystical blood that has magical powers. And I'm saying this because in the church that I grew up with, People would plead the blood over other people and their vehicles and their houses. And they would plead the blood. And I never, I never could understand it. I tried to understand this. Those who plead the blood often so do as if it were something magical in those words. Or as if by using them their prayer is more powerful. I don't know. And by pleading the blood of Jesus they kind of take authority, the authority of Christ over the spirit world, uh, world and announcing to the forces of darkness that they are in, they are powerless and we have authority over it. That's, I think, the kind of idea that people have when they plead the blood. Now, first and foremost, let me just say this, that there's no way in the Bible where it, when it talks about the blood of Christ, it talks about that. It's not what it means in the Bible when he talks about it. It always refers to the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, so the blood of Christ is not something magical or mystical. It talk, when the Bible call, it talks about the blood of Christ, it talks about the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what it talks about. Secondly, I do not find one example in the whole scripture where someone pleads the blood over he, another person, other persons, over his car, over his possessions, um, as I have heard so many people do. 
I grew up in that. But I simply don't find this in the Bible. And it's not biblical. So that was just a free sermon now. Um, we can take offering for that. <laughs> Sideline. Okay. Just let's come back to Romans 5. Um, to, to our theme this morning. Now, <clears throat> 5 verse 9 says, We have been justified by His blood. Meaning that we are saved on the basis of Christ's death. The blood symbolizes the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And Paul explains this in the next verse. Okay, I've jumped scripture somewhere. Oh, he's still there. Verse 10. He says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. So he explains this. We were reconciled to the death of His Son. How much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through His life? Now, just notice the tenses. Now, those who have English grammar, the tenses, past, present, future, just notice that. We were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. Were reconciled. Is that salvation, past, present, or future? Past past and then it says we shall be saved that's the next yellow line we shall be saved through his life is that salvation past present or future future, future. future. let's put this together i want you to see the parallel that well, that we see in this verse and not carefully he says in verse 9 and he says in verse 10 and that's why i made it yellow so that you can follow it's it's a parallel that he makes. He says we have been justified by his blood in verse 9. In verse 10 he says we were reconciled by the death of his son. Same thing. Just say, says it in two different ways. And then we have the next words that he uses in red. How much more? And that's important. You can underline that. How much more in your Bible. And then verse 9 and 10 again, we see we shall be saved from God's wrath. And in verse 10, we shall be saved through His life. And also through Him. Can you see the parallel that Paul puts in, this, in the verse? Now, <clears throat> if Christ's death saved a sinner, how much more will He save us? In the future right? when he's alive okay you didn't get it now if you think what Christ's death that his death saved you reconciled you to God justified you if you think that is awesome let me tell you something how much more will we be saved from the future right? While he is alive. Okay, didn't get it. When I saw this truth, this opened so much things up for me as, as a Christian. How much, look what God can do. Look what, if Christ's death, while you were a sinner, you were an enemy. If his death saved you. How much more will He save you as a believer while He is alive? I want to say this again. I am saved forever. Why? Because He lives. I am saved forever because God is faithful always let me go to Hebrews 7 25 it says consequently he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always live to make intercession for them and I can go to 1 John chapter 2 What's the, uh, chapter 1 says that nobody is not without sin if you say you don't sin then you're a liar 
He says, but if we sin, we confess our sin, God forgives us. And then he goes to um, chapter 2 and he says, we have an advocate, Christ Jesus, who intercedes for us daily. Now this is the thing. God saved you, but now he's at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for you daily. That's how you are sanctified daily. That's how you are saved daily. That's how you are kept daily. Why? Because God is faithful always. God is faithful always. He saves us completely. He saves us because He is faithful. Now, let's go to joy in God. And joy is, is, is like the pinnacle of this all. It... <laughs> <laughs> joy is the reality if you see all these things together if you see these six guarantees if you see all of this together joy is the reality chapter 5 verse 11 says not only this is this so but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through Him whom we have now received reconciliation. Now the word boast is the same word that he uses in verse 2. When he talks about we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the God. We, <clears throat> the King James Version said in verse 11, We also rejoice in God. We have peace with God. We have the grace of God. We have hope of glory. We have the love of God in our hearts. We have freedom and we have joy in God. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if there is one thing, one emotion, one thought, one characteristic that should dominate the Christian's life, that is joy. If you're not a joyful Christian, you must come for me and let me pray for you. Really? People of God, we must be joyful. Because God saved us. And He keeps us. And He's faithful. And we must be joyful. That should be the outcome. And if all these guarantees we, walk, we talked about do not bring you joy, then nothing will. Then I don't know. Although salvation gives us a hopeful future, it is also presently brings us happiness. If we, are, if we want to talk about happiness, we talk about salvation. I know there's many preachers who talk about how to be happy. One, two, three. Okay. But let me tell you, if you want to be happy and joyful, you must be saved. And you must have assurance of your salvation. So I'll have a sermon one day, how to be happy. <laughs> and everybody will come and I say, okay, this is how you get saved. <laughs> okay? Because true happiness, true joy is in God. The fact that you place your place in heaven is secure <coughs> must satisfy you. It must bring you joy. Paul says in Philippians 4 verse 4. He said, Rejoice in the Lord always I gain. Uh, again, I will say, rejoice in the Lord. Yes, we rejoice in our salvation, but more importantly, we rejoice in the Lord. We rejoice in the Lord. For it is He that made it possible. In fact, I want to go there as far as saying that if you do not rejoice, it is a sin not to rejoice. I mean, what more do you want from life? Do you want happiness? More happiness? Do you want more convenience? Do you want more pleasure? More possessions? What more would make you happy? What will bring you joy if these things that we talked about does not bring you joy? Let me say to you, <laughs> some people say... <laughs> think marriage will bring joy. At <laughs> least <laughs> my wife's not decided. Ah, <laughs> Listen, marriage is not for... You don't marry for happiness. 
you marry for holiness. And um, I've, I've, I've discovered the verse that if you don't have, want any marital problems in your life, come on the 9th of September. <laughs> okay? But 1 Corinthians 7 verse 28 says, if you marry, you will have trouble. <laughs> Go read it. If you marry, you will have trouble. Okay, I'll leave all the rest for tonight. <coughs> Romans 5 says, Not only is this so, not only is all these things wonderful that Paul is talking about, but we also boast in God. We rejoice in God. Through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We received the most wonderful, amazing gift of God. Although God, we just, God, that was not, not God's ultimate purpose. And some people are mad at me when I say this. God, Christ did not die on the cross just to save you. Christ died on the cross, number one purpose, for the glory of God. We're just beneficiaries of that. Every child of God should have joy. Joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And joy in God is a deeply rooted joy that no one can steal from you. Joy in the glory of God. Let me read a few scriptures then I'm going to end. Psalm 34 verse 2. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. And as man is sickle and joy to thy name. There's nothing wrong, man. You're so unemotional sometimes in church. <coughs> Oh goodness. I trap up to her for her. There's nothing wrong to be emotional. I think that's one of the reasons God invented marriage. Is to bring that emotional world back into a man's life. <laughs> because men has been taught from this cowboys don't cry. And we become hard and we become Closed mind, unemotional. Okay? Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Habakkuk, 3 verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in God of my salvation. David, when he sinned, what did he say? Lord, give me back the joy of my salvation. The joy of my salvation. Psalm 43, verse 4. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the Lord, O God my God. There is nothing in ourselves to boast about, nothing in ourselves to be proud of. We boast in Jesus Christ. In Him we have found peace. In Him we have found grace. In Him we have found hope. In Him we have love. In Him we have deliverance. And in Him is our joy. <coughs> May we joy in our salvation because God is the God of salvation. And He is faithful always. Let's pray together. Father God, thank You for this wonderful truth in Your Word. May we just grasp the deep meaning of what it means to have peace in God what it means to have hope in Christ, what it means to be fixed in grace, Lord. Help us to understand what your love means and what deliverance means and also help us to understand joy. And may your joy be our joy. May we just praise you exceedingly in our lives and we worship you for that in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. <coughs>